You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who've been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Hi, Stella. I'm really, really looking forward to this episode. Yeah. Hello, Sasha. I am too. I think that when people talk about social transition, I think it's never been in the language before. I think it's a new concept. And it's it's kind of, it's seeped in without any pause, without any reflection. And I hope that we can give some kind of massive kind of analysis of what's going on when people talk about social transition. Because it's like it came from nowhere. It's like a, a brother of affirmative that mm. just kind of arrived in without anybody yeah. saying, let's do these interventions on these children. And so that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> it's there. There's so much to cover and I, I hope we can do it justice. I guess like something that just popped into my head was that, um, you know, you and I have looked a little bit at the work of a psychologist named Catherine Twerk, I think. T- You're right. T-U-E-R-K, T-U-R-K, I think, right? And she, um, she is, uh, I think, a developmental psychologist who specializes in feminine gay boys. And her work has really shifted a lot over the last few decades because I think it was, you know, in the 80s or 90s, she was kind of a specialist. And so parents who had a very feminine boy who was maybe struggling with gender identity, but really different in terms of the way he expresses gender, would visit with um, Dr. Turek. And she wrote a lot about pre-gay boys. And she herself, I think, had a son who was feminine and ended up growing up to be a gay man. And she writes a little bit about the shift she started to observe, I think, in the early 2010s. Is that right? Correct me if I'm well, wrong on well, the Well, kind of in the early noughties, around 2005, yeah, 2006, okay. she noticed that a new concept, rather than pre-gay kids, these were starting to be uh, described as uh, transgender kids. Yeah. And for Twerk, she was like, whoa, well, what's happening here? There's something different. And it's kind of interesting for anybody who's listening that it's actually um, she she was she follows the kind of the the trek of Jazz Jennings, who was called a different name at the time, but it was 2006. And Jazz really was the kind of first what's the word role model of the socially transitioned child of the Mm -hmm. transgender kid. And so a transgender kid as such is a socially transitioned child, a child Mm -hmm. for whom the family has decided to make this intervention, which is called socially transition. And um, the the, the most well known is Jazz Jennings, but also one of the first. Now, I'm sure there was kind of very unusual outliers in the 1790s and in the 1940s and whatever. But really in the medical literature, when it started was in the, between 2000 and 2010, there was a shift noted by Catherine Twerk about people who had been, children who had been considered as little, what were they called? There, there was words, sissies, sissies. Mm, mm-hmm. And everybody, every all the adults in the room would presume that that kid was going to be gay. It wasn't spoken about a huge amount, but the general presumption in the air was that and that got turned into that kid is transgender in that in that decade and it's an extraordinary kind of move that nobody Mm -hmm. stopped to say well what is social transition why who should do it who Mm -hmm. should carry out Mm -hmm. social transition and in what criteria when should it happen Rather than that, they haven't done it like that. Instead, it's been kind of the enthusiasm of the parents and the strength of personality of the children seem to have led the situation about whether social transition is going to occur or not. It doesn't seem to be anything else. People say the phrase insistent, consistent and persistent, but that's personality, I would argue. Yeah. You yeah. know, but um, nobody, nobody really realises, I would say, not nobody, the sweeping generalisation, Often, mm-hmm. 
it is not described as an intervention. Often it is not termed or kind of conceptualized as a as a significant psychological intervention. And I think it is. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting because it's so much about like a paradigm shift in how we understand extreme gender nonconformity in children. And I'm thinking about there's a kind of now a well-known story out of Pearland, Texas, my my home state of Texas, where um, a woman named Kimberly Shapley had a male child who was insisting that he was a girl. And Kimberly has talked, she's the mother, and she's talked at length in lots of interviews about how she first responded to her son's femininity. And she says, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I screamed at him. I tried to make him stop being feminine. And I would have days where I said, I cannot spank this child anymore today. Like she was really, really um, punishing that behavior. And apparently they grew up in a very kind of conservative Texas town where everybody um, had very kind of old school ideas about gender. And, you know, when you hear this woman talking in these interviews, I mean, she has since completely changed her perspective. She's, I'm going to use this in air quotes, gotten educated, quote unquote, about transgender children. And now is raising this young person. I don't really know the updates on the story, but has raised her son as a girl. So now this is her daughter and this is a transgender girl. And her story is just very interesting because... She frames the whole experience of raising this child as having been about transgender rather than this is an effeminate boy or a feminine boy or a boy who wishes to be a girl that will, as probably someone like Catherine Twerk would say, pretty obviously would grow up uh, most likely to be a gay man. And Mm. so the whole idea of social transition is really predicated on a new way of understanding what gender nonconformity means in childhood and what statements about biological sex really mean. And so we have just completely changed the way we address these kids. And interestingly, there was probably maybe like a 15 to 25 year span of time where psychologists might have actually advised parents to say, you know, it's okay to be a feminine boy. It's, you know, you're a boy, but it's okay to like dresses. Like we went from, you're not allowed to say that you have to dress like a boy to, oh, you can say that because you're actually a girl. And there was like almost no time (laughs) in between where actual gender nonconformity was embraced. Very little time. It was it was extraordinary. But not only that, if we did a little thought experiment and we went back to, let's say, 25 years ago to 1995 or 94 or something, whatever it was. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, we're raising them as uh, I gave birth to a little girl, but she was actually she was assigned female at birth. But uh, she she demonstrated an awful lot of male um, personalities, stereotypes. She liked playing with trucks and and boys clothes and she didn't like being a girl and so now we're go we're calling her by a boy's name we're going by he him we've completely changed and we've gone into the school and we've completely changed and so they're now our lovely little boy and uh we're actually um making sure that the policy of the school changes so to accommodate our little boy who's now going into the boys' dressing room and also doing the po- boys' uh, change room in, in, in swimming and things like that, our heads would fall off. That's yeah. in 25 years, an extraordinary speed of conceptualising a non-conforming child has happened. Rather than just saying, oh, kids, yeah, let them be there. I'm not sure um, how much pain we're avoiding by changing these children so quickly, if you follow me, yeah. because I would have thought I still think liberation is being able to do whatever you want without label- labeling it. Mm-hmm. And these kids are being labeled and they're being labeled apparently in a kind of ostensible free way, but it's still labeling. Mm-hmm. And we, we don't know because there is no 20. The, the, the oldest socially transitioned kid is about 20. 
It's about jazz, Jenny. It's not that much longer than that, older than that. So we don't actually know what the, mm-hmm. are they going to come and say, I remember. I remember I was a boy and then you all made me a girl. I remember. We, we don't know yet. We will know. Yeah. I'd say in the next yeah. 10 years, we'll find out what they thought of, our, of the social transition. But the schools, the way that we've all kind of nowadays, I'm not even sure that they'd bring in psychologists to the schools. I think they would just change it. I think they would just yeah. change without any sort of professional kind of analysis. Well, at least yeah. five years ago, there would have been psychologists on board. Now it's mm-hmm. just become such a a dumb thing. It's happening even without, I think, without any. Certainly the stories I'm hearing, it's been happening without professional yeah. consultation. Yeah, I mean, my head is kind of spinning. I, there's a lot. There's a lot to think about with the schools, but I wonder if it might work well for us to kind of almost go chronologically. Like, let's talk about the really early interventions where you have a family with two or three or four-year-old who's, you know, perhaps perhaps part of it is not just about clothing and toys, but it's maybe the child who's really insistent and the parents are like, I don't know what to do here. You know, I think a lot of families in that position are very well-meaning, yeah, but they, they might notice the type of distress that the young person is in when they try to argue with them about their biological sex. And so inevitably, you know, they think, well, this is an odd situation, but there is this thing called trans kids. I wonder if I should go to a gender clinic and get some support here. So maybe we'll talk about this early intervention and what that means and what social transition looks like for a young child, like under the age of Eight or Eight. nine. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's because it's prepubescent, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it starts early. It starts kind of two. And there is a kind of a, a developmental stage between in and around two and six where the kids become quite gendered in their in their mentality. I think it's very interesting what happens to the child and how the parents and the uh, world around them responds really impacts the child. I was thinking, why would anybody argue with that two or three year old if they say they're a boy? I, my instinct would be, God, mm-hmm. let them off. Who'd argue? And then I thought, well, maybe you would, because maybe you'd be afraid they're losing some sort of grasp of reality. And I think we're filled with terror as parents and we're always trying to do the right thing. We're always trying to do it right. And I can imagine as soon as the kid is saying, I'm, I'm a boy and, you know, you've got me wrong. And you'd read an article about transgender kids. You think, oh, my God, I've got one. Mm-hmm. And w- mm-hmm. would would you feel really kind of almost frightened, but kind of you've got something special happening mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and and you have to do the right thing for them? You'd almost feel like you're going into holy ground. I've got something really unusual yeah. happening here and I need to be really careful. Almost like some sort of like prodigy, magical, special kid or something, you know, um, that doesn't abide by the normal rules of childhood. And, you know, you've talked often, Stella, about the exceptionalism around trans kids and how that can warp our understanding of what's going on. And I think that's really a big part of it. I mean, trans kids are treated as though they are this special population. Um, and of course they're, they're special insofar as like they are unique and they're individuals and they're of course of value. So I don't mean to denigrate that, but there's something about the way providers, parents, everybody in their lives have to, uh, bubble wrap these kids almost. And I, I just feel like there's something, uh, different about the way trans identifying kids are treated compared to like typical kids. Yeah, they are special, but they're no more special than anybody else. And I think it's very healthy for children to know that, yeah, you are special. Yeah, certainly you're special. And everybody else in the room is special and I'm special. I think I think it's really important to make sure that we always keep that in the centre, that nobody's more special than anybody else. I do remember as a kid, anybody who doesn't know me, although I've said this story so often, (laughs) I'm sure you're all looking at the eyes at the back of your head now. But anyway, yeah, I did have gender issues as a kid, but I do remember that I was special. I do remember that you would see the adults. I do remember this feeling of the adults slightly testing how far will she push it and then being impressed with, oh, she goes all the way. 
Mm. I do remember that. How so? What's an example? I can't think of an example. It's a feeling of they they test my metal Mm. and every single time I stick it to them and they go, right? She's the, you know, like, whoa, (laughs) heavy. Mm. This is, this is a heavy kid. This is an intense kid. Mm. I do remember I would consistently get that. Like, like parents would, or not parents, but adults would be a little bit kind of smiley and uh, patronizing. And then they'd say, oh, Jeannie, got a live one here. Mm. Mm. (laughs) This kid is very intense about it. I do specifically impressing them with the power of my insistence. Okay, I see. Without a doubt, I was well aware of it. And I would say, I see it in kids now. I see it in those kids now. They're well aware that it's something incredibly impressive of a very certain kid. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking about like interviews that I've seen from very, let's say, progressive media outlets um, or outlets that are totally bought into the idea of a transgender child who don't really question the concept of a transgender child. People will talk to these kids as though the kids have some absolute really special knowledge about things. And they'll say, when did you know that you were a boy? (laughs) <laughs> to a female child and, 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 and like with such certainty and almost such reverence for what the child is saying and I, I can't help but think here that there might be something out of order in the relationship between adults and children in this realm and I I, I, I feel like there's a lot of value in you know, honoring the the thoughts and ideas and perspectives of a child, letting them have the room to develop and grow and share their ideas. Like, I think that's really important. But I also think that the adults have a responsibility to help teach the child about life, about the realities of the world. And it feels like something is a bit off when you have doctors and therapists and adults asking a five-year-old to tell them the truth about something. This is really fascinating. And I've been tracking this recently because I've been studying something around this. And it's like we went from human-centered, person-centered, Carl Rogers. That's for anybody who doesn't study uh, counseling. You know, in the 70s and mm-hmm. stuff, Carl Rogers, he was absolutely brilliant. And he kind of, you know, centered the, centered the person in the therapy. Let's be person-centered about this. Let the client lead the way. We will follow the client. It's not our job. And it's so nice and it's so egalitarian. And I get it. Really, really powerful. Okay. And then, you know, it, it, it moved on. And at the very, uh, kind of simultaneously, at the same time, they were having child-centered um, uh, child care. And so they were centering the child. So centering the child, centering the person, that's fine. And then it became um, person-led and child-led. And suddenly it was being led by the child, which is a whole other different kettle of fish. And not only that... At the same time, from around about the 1950s onwards, we started a glory in, in, in youth culture. And, it, you know, it's phenomenal, really, what happened with teenagers and stuff and how much, you know, the youths in the 1960s led the, the culture, you know, and changed, mm-hmm. you know, our thinking. But we've been glorying in young people for, for a good 70 years now. And we presume they have wi- wisdom. And we presume they have knowledge and there's, there's some sort of, it's as if they're closer to, to godlike knowledge because they're younger, which yeah. is, it's just, it's yeah. just rubbish. <laughs> they don't know as much as we know. They don't have as much experiences. They don't have, it's almost religious. It's like, oh, a few years ago you were in the cradle of God's hands and now you're seven. So you're that little bit more special than silly old me who's 46. It's like, no, 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 no. Mm. None of that is right. <laughs> so we're and glorying mm-hmm. in kids. We're giving them special qualities. It's, it's farcical. And there's, I think there's a, a bit of nihilism about adult human life built into this perspective because this view treats kids as though they are untainted 
by oh, the yeah. drudgery of adulthood. So it's like, you know, I have heard in like the positive psychology movement and stuff, they'll say, you know, when you are a child, you have all these dreams and all of these <laughs> possibilities. And then as you become an adult, you lose that wonderful childlike uh, p- potential. And it's, it's very degrading to the adult stance because it elevates the really, I mean, naive innocence of childhood to some kind of higher plane. Whereas the dumb adults who have been dragged down by their corporate jobs and their nine to fives, they're the ones who don't understand anything. Yeah. And that's kind of part of that kind of countercultural hippie thing, you know what I mean? And like, uh, you know, there was some lovely <laughs> lyrics to the songs and, you know, the kids knew it all at the times they yeah. are changing and all that. And yet at the same time, there is a, a you know, historically, if you think about it, in the Christian religion and in an awful lot of religions, there was a feeling of original sin and that children were little beasts and they had to they had to be kind of bet into submission so they'd become good working functioning adults. And then mm-hmm. Emile Rousseau came out in about the kind of 18th century with, um, you know, the concept of the innate goodness of the child. And it's from this that the whole child center, child led they're they're little angels mm. any child is and rather than we the adults have to kind of knock the kids into submission we need to be listening to these special special angels who are close to god almost i don't even know what mm-hmm. the concept mm-hmm. is but they're along those lines and if only we beastly adults could listen to these good children we'd have such a good world Society, anybody that's yeah, right. anybody who's raised children would say oh my god th- like the average two-year-old is a, a tyrant <laughs> a despot and a violent one too who will just punch people so that he can get his blue cup you know what I mean <laughs> so so this idea that the closer they are to 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 babyhood to zero the the better they are it's not true Though I would say it's very definitely we're born with a kind of I'm not saying that we're hideous little kind of beasts that have to be kind of socialized. But I do think that we're born more animalistic and that the adults in the in charge of us socialize us. Mm -hmm. I I think that's fair enough. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, I think I think anyone who spends time around a small child I mean, I don't have children, but I have like nieces and nephews and stuff. And there is, of course, like all human beings, a whole mosaic of things about the child. Like you see moments where they're very selfish and um, they're willing to kind of do really manipulative things to get their way. And then you see these other moments where they do have such a pure, good desire to make the world better or like be nice or be kind. So children are whole people. They're not... They're not these perfect exemplars for how we should all strive to be. But there's something interesting, I think, about this particular time in our culture. And at least here in America, children are used so much for political activism. And I think it's tapping into this idea that, you know, kids are pure. They're not tarnished by things like financial incentives or some ulterior motives. If a child thinks this is the right thing to do, then it must actually be a pure desire or a pure objective. And I think that is a very interesting way that this ties into (laughs) social transition, which is basically let the child lead the way. If a five-year-old says that he is actually a girl, let's follow that child's lead. Yeah. Which, yeah, you're, you're right. And I agree with you about that. We're, we're following the child and there's no, reason why we think the child is more wise but we tend to and it's something around purity and I'm not sure that there's I I think um I honestly think most adults are better than most children I think kids are gorgeous and they're lovely but there's madness in them (laughs) they want to control like look at any child on their birthday party (laughs) (laughs) you didn't meet me as a child I was perfect I was an (laughs) angel you know that brilliant (laughs) quote uh, we are born of risen apes, not fallen angels. Mm. I think, you know, it stands. Mm. It stands like we, 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 we are animals and we have been socialized and we're born and we're looking for food and we're looking for shelter. And whoever will give it, 
that's where we gravitate towards. And then we start kind of going further into our psyche and we start looking for power. We start looking for love. And you know what I mean? This is what's developing as the child is developing. And somewhere along the way, some children, why we do not know, fixate upon certain things of this mm-hmm. is what I want. Mm-hmm. And let's say this five-year-old that we're thinking of, they decide that something and for the children who decide around gender, they get listened to in an extraordinary degree. If they decided about something else, it wouldn't get listened to. It's, 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 you know what I mean? If there was other, if it wasn't gender that they were declaring about, like, for example, I don't love daddy is a really common one. I love mommy and mm. I don't love daddy. Do you follow me? Mm. Or vice versa, because they start playing the parents off each other. That's really common. And we all laugh and go, oh, yeah, we're going through that phase. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, it's awful for the other parent, by the way. <laughs> but so you know how do I mean? people usually react when a kid says, I don't love daddy? It's, it's very accepted. If you went on, on any parent group right now and said that, everybody would say it's a common phase. People happen. It happens. It doesn't mean anything. The child does understand the kind of concept of, of playing people off each other, realizing that there's a special relationship, wanting to insert themselves in the middle of the parent relationship. It's cool. Roll with it. Don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything. Well, mm. if they declare, and any parent will be nodding along saying, yeah, I've heard that, I've heard that. Do, do you know what I mean? I don't mm-hmm. want this. I don't want you. I don't want you. No, mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. I want I want mommy and things like okay. that, you know. And it's common, yeah. like even when they're like sick in bed. No, not you. I don't want daddy. I want mommy. Mm. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That fair play to them. They're finding their power. But yeah. to think that like taking, you know, the onesie and unsnapping the buttons or taking, you know, a, a bobbin out of your hair and suddenly that's that's a gendered communication, as Diane Aaron says, Saf says. And it, it seems to suddenly imbue so much wisdom and, and strength of purpose to a child when we're not listening to lots of things that they say. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to bring up something else, too. I think I've talked about this before, but there is a concept in developmental psychology called sex constancy. And this is kind of a a cognitive milestone that kids will reach somewhere between, I've heard varying things, between the age of five and eight. Okay, so sex constancy is the understanding that sex is constant. So for example, if you take a four-year-old and she, let's say she's looking at her male peer, let's say Peter is her peer from school, and Peter is put in a dress And you ask the little girl, like, is Peter a boy or a girl? She'd say, oh, Peter's a girl now. Peter's wearing a dress. And around the age between five and eight, what will happen is if you do the same exact scenario and you put Peter in a dress and you ask the little girl about it, she'll say, no, that's just Peter. He's still a boy, but he's wearing a dress. Uh huh. So at some point in a child's development between five and eight, they're able to understand the concept of sex. So I think what's particularly troubling about early social transition is that you're manipulating a child before they could even have the capacity oh to understand oh my God. that they can't change sex. So a four-year-old doesn't know that they can't actually change sex. So you have to feed them this whole story to deny reality that like, Let's say Peter thought he was a girl and he's four. You have to buy into that and you have to keep playing through this story until, funny enough, what does Aaron Saft say? Yeah. When do kids tank? Because this is, has to do with sex constancy. As, to as explain pu- that. Yeah, puberty comes in. And as Aaron Saft said, Diane Aaron Saft is one of the major advocates for um, not only social transition, but medical transition of children um, with puberty blockers, etc., she said on the Louis Theroux program, Trans Kids, she said they, they don't tank, but they slope. As in there's a there's a fall from a cliff emotionally in and around prepubescence, pubescence. And what okay. is it? There's a very, I would say, the brick wall of reality of, exactly. oh, my God, I thought I could just change. I could just exactly. be somebody different. Right, right. And that feels really reckless that we've we've allowed children at four, to socially transition, to actually become somebody else. We've led them to believe that they are somebody else. And Before then they could even understand what they're doing. Yeah. And then they have a reckoning where they think, oh, I have to actually do this thing called medical transition. And I'm not actually, even though I've told everybody, 
that I'm the that I'm a boy, for example, even though I was born a girl or whatever. Um, now I actually have to kind of do things to make myself that person. It feels really, really difficult on the psyche. I've definitely met per- parents over the years and they have found it very difficult, you know, when they realize that the child is, you know, the child is coming to a kind of a reckoning around about pre-puberty and puberty of, oh, social transition wasn't enough. Now I have to do a whole medical thing. And it's like all sorts of things are going to follow from that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is where, you know, and I'm guilty of it myself. I think there's an awful, I was only talking to an old friend of mine the other day and he said, I don't know why you're so bothered, Stella. Like, I've heard this stat that 80% of them grow out of it anyway. So why are you so bothered? They're all going to grow mm. out of it. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you have nothing for socially transitioned kids. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, we don't know what's going to happen with them. They're, they've never been studied. Well, that was the biggest news to this guy. He thought puberty mm. blockered kids. He thought socially transitioned They'd all grow out of it. It didn't matter at all. You know what I mean? It was no biggie. You know, I just had a problem with them socially transitioning in childhood was his version of events mm. as opposed to no, 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 no. We don't actually know how this is going to impact. I know because I know my psychology that it's definitely going to impact your psyche mm-hmm. to be told you're something different to what you are and yeah. to live like that for some years is yeah. Yeah. impact. Well, you know, I, I just had a conversation like this recently about, um, you know, when when therapists advise for parents to follow the child's lead. And, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically about kids who are a bit older. But, you know, they say, like, it's it's important for the child to explore their identity if this is the identity they're questioning. And I think that's based on the premise that your friend probably holds, which is the truth will come out. You know, if you let someone, quote, explore, they'll figure out what's real for them. And what I've come to believe is that that is a very blurry, slippery slope, because if you affirm and explore that identity and confirm it by social transition, you're actually doing a powerful intervention which continues to mold that child in that direction whereas some people think it's like a magic fit you know you can't fit a square peg in a round hole therefore if you try on the identity and it's not who you were supposed to be it'll it'll fall away but that's not actually true and what we know from looking at some of the recent um detransition uh polls and surveys that social affirmation, especially by therapists and professionals, plays a really big role in pushing somebody who is questioning their gender down a medical path. So this idea of like, if you explore, you'll find the truth. It's not always true because we're very malleable. We all are. Um, and it's how you explore. You said earlier, and I thought it was such a good point. Like Back in the day, there was a concept called watchful waiting. And the idea of watchful waiting was that the professionals would wait and see. And they do it in other, in other, you know, you might go to the hospital tonight, God forbid, if something was wrong and they could watchfully wait. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The, the wait mm-hmm. and see. Mm-hmm. And it's usually done in a longer context of we'll see how this pans out. And that was the way children who were nonconforming, who were brought to clinics, that was the way that uh, most uh, professionals took it. And even then, can I just pause for a second? Mm -hmm. My parents were never going to send me to any psychologist. It's just it was not in the thinking back then. It's just laugh. They might as well have tried to, I don't know, send me off to the sail the seven seas it was just never going to happen you know mm-hmm. what I mean mm-hmm. and so you'd have to be a certain type of kind of interventionist parent mm. to, to look for kind of help professional help for just gender non-conforming behavior and then you've got uh, uh, professionals who said let's let's wait watchfully and um, watch watch the child as they um, grow and we will see whether we need to do further interventions in the future. But nowadays, um, there's very little interest in waiting watchfully. And instead, it's very much affirm the child, affirm the child, which is being immediately interpreted as 
socially transition the child. It's not a firm. It's actually, a, and now let's do a powerful intervention, which is right. socially transition the child. Right. We have, we, there's a, the linguistic creep has happened here and a conceptual creep that a firm equals socially transition. Well, I would say, mm-hmm. hang on. A firm is to say, I can see that you want to be a boy and I can see, I can see that it matters to you and I can see that this is a big deal. That's affirming. Mm-hmm. Socially transitioning is running with that ball and saying, and now we're going to make fairly dramatic changes in your life to you and how everybody else perceives you. And we're going to change um, toilet policy in your school and we're going to change swimming policy. We're going to do huge interventions now. So it's it's so far from affirming and into confirming and running with the ball. To We need a whole new word for what that is because it's nothing to do yeah. with affirmation. But Back then, when a child was wait, you know, when they were watchfully waiting, they weren't in this affirmative world. So, yeah, it's I think comparable. about that a lot. Yeah, yeah when, when I when I talk with parents about it, you know, they say, "Well, we want to do the watchful waiting method, and that seems to give the child more room to explore and all of that." And I think that's that's right. I mean, I think it's a great it's a great concept, but I think the problem is because of how profoundly influenced we all are by peers and our social environment, particularly in the adolescent years. So we were kind of fast forwarding a little bit now. Um, The social environment and the landscape in which you find yourself, the context really matters. So if we think back about when Zucker and Bradley were using watchful waiting in the 80s and 90s or early, early 2000s. Totally. Schools were neutral enough and other kids were neutral enough to where they weren't teaching sex as a, not, as a binary in the health ed curriculum. Like this wasn't on the consciousness of anybody. So if a kid who is a female, let's say she kind of wants to be a boy and she's still being treated like a girl at school and maybe she's kind of wearing some boyish clothes or playing with boy toys the world around her is still neutral enough to where she could go in a bunch of different directions. But what we have now is a whole environment that is so affirmative and confirmative that watchful waiting almost seems anachronistic because watchful waiting where like your parents may be the only people on the planet waiting and everybody else is confirming. So it makes it very tricky for parents to pump the brakes and use that kind of more um, slow approach. Yeah, that's so true. It's so true. So the people who think they're using the watchful waiting approach are using it in an environment that it wasn't designed in. And so it's 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 completely different. It's not really. And back when I was a kid, I was always asked, are you a boy or girl? Are you a boy or a girl? And, you know, I handled that whatever way I did. These days, these kids are asked, are you trans? And that is opening up all sorts of questions in that kid's mind. Like, am I trans? Am I? Am I? Maybe I am. Well, maybe I must be. And so that is a whole, had I been asked, are you trans? I would have, well, obviously I'm trans is what I would have answered. (laughs) Jesus Christ, like how much evidence do you need? Of course I'm trans. But um, it wasn't being asked. Do do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm, massive. mm -hmm. And I know because I've heard so many parents because I've had that experience, they gravitate towards me when they've had a gender nonconforming kid. And they say, I, you know, I have a kid that was just like you. And now they're 11 and everybody's asking them, are they trans? I know. It is so hard. And I mean, this is also true for gender nonconforming kids who aren't even initially questioning their nope. gender. Like you talk to anybody who was really gender nonconforming as a kid. And if you're a girl who has a masculine presentation after the 100th time that yes. somebody asks you, are you a girl? Why do you dress like that? Why do you walk like that? Why do you talk like that? It's exhausting and it Uh, starts to chip away at your own sense of identity. Death by a thousand cuts, you know, it's it's just you can either continuously ask something and it's continuously brought up and you're waiting for it then. You're self-conscious and you're waiting for it. And you know people across there in the huddle are talking about it because they don't know you very well and they're trying Mm -hmm. to figure it out. How can a gender non-conforming child get through childhood now without being labelled? I do not know because, you know, go and live in... You know, Venezuela or I don't know where. (laughs) Not Venezuela, I don't know where. (laughs) Yeah, I don't, I really don't know. And I mean, interestingly, 
there, there are kids out there that are able to say, you know, I'm a lesbian or I am gay or I'm bi. But, but my impression, the sense that I get is that this has very, like little to do now with gender nonconformity and more to do purely with like attractions and like romantic interests. Whereas I think 30 years ago, we as a society understood that if if you say, oh, the gay community, you're talking about gender nonconformity inherently as part of it. But now I think all the gender nonconformity oh God. aspects of this have been, really come under the gender identity umbrella. So now we're talking about non-binary. Now we're talking about agender. Now we're talking about transgender. So, And frankly, there's very often, I have to say it, there's very often well-meaning, misinformed adults who are kind of thrilled to be using their new words. Yeah. I'm kind of thrilled to be telling the kid that they're they look they seem to be transgender and you know do oh, what's your pronouns. There's an mm. excitement about the new that I, I I don't think kind of reflects very well on adults, but it's really noticeable that there's a kind of a well-meaning adult who often brings the whole thing into a ho- much more serious realm than they need it to be. But I do think that this concept of what's your pronouns doesn't really give any cognizance to the fact that it's are you socially transitioning is what mm. what that question is saying if you follow me it's not it's it's not what's your pronouns because your pronouns because of the linguistic arrangement of our language your pronouns are what are used by other people they're not my pronouns they're what are used by other people to talk about me but you get to decide that now. I mean, that's the thing. That's what the social transition and, means. Yeah. And that's social transition. Because I think that we need to take a step back. That phrase, what's your pronouns, means have you transitioned? Is there social transition? Is there medical transition? That's There's a huge amount of layers in what's your pronouns. And it also implies that you're obviously not fitting in with your birth sex. Mm-hmm. Yet again, going back to stereotypes. And I know you said it's not all based on stereotypes and, and, and stuff, but you have to, we have to look at the childhood kind of criteria for gender dysphoria in the DSM. And five out of the eight of the criteria, I would argue, are based on stereotypes to do with games, clothes. Yes, you know what I course. mean? Yeah. And so there, there is a very gendered um, type box that people are expected to live in these days. I, I agree a hundred percent. And I think it's almost like if A equals B and B equals C. So I think like for this, the young children, the, the, not the adolescent onset gender question, but for the young ones, it's almost always about those stereotypes. And then I think with the adolescent onset, sometimes it's about those stereotypes, but a lot of times it has nothing to do with those stereotypes But then once they start questioning their gender, perhaps due to the socially mediated aspect of it or some other distress or general adolescent identity questioning, then they start to perform the gender nonconformity in a way that wasn't necessarily a part of their kind of organic development. So I guess like to, to kind of think about... This, these are such difficult topics, and that's why I find we're, we're veering off into mm. all these directions. But well, I, oh, one thing we are we, doing in our defense yes. is we're giving it the weight that it deserves. We're, <laughs> yes. we're not kind of saying, oh, woo, woo, you know yeah. what I mean, what's your pronouns? We're actually saying, well, these are huge, huge, yes. changing kind of concepts at the risk of yeah. taking ourselves too seriously. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think these are important things to think about because what we're doing as a field, the mental health field is just like regurgitating these phrases like social transition is the process by which an individual starts to dress and adopt the sex that they identify with. Like it's just this pat kind of definition. And what we're saying is, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is profound and has very serious implications and comes from a line of trends and shifts and patterns that are worth examining in our field because it has real implications for gender nonconforming people and for gay people and for everybody else, frankly. So I I think you're right. We're giving it the weight that it deserves. 
I think, imagine what I want to know what you think. If you know, we've, we've, we've kind of explored the child. What do you think the average 13 year old who socially transitions and who requests their parents and the family and the school change the toilets for me? Mm. You know, let me change mm. my whatever toilets I go to, dressing rooms, sports, names, pronouns, the whole thing. How do you think that is impacting that child psychologically? I'm of a, a few minds on this, to be honest. I think there are some kids, and ironically, I think the more distress a kid is under, the less advisable social transition probably is, to be honest. There are some kids who are so desperate to build a new identity or escape whatever distress they're running away from that having the social transition really helps symbolically to, to concretize this move away from the old self towards the new self. And that is actually really risky. And the other side of this coin is that I think sometimes, and we touched on this a bit with non-binary, I think sometimes kids are doing this very, very normal, lighthearted identity exploration, kind of like one week you wear combat boots and a trench coat and you have purple hair and the next week you're preppy or whatever. Like sometimes this is light and age appropriate and developmentally yeah. appropriate and they can cycle through these things without it becoming this very deep, heavy, brooding experience. So I think it impacts kids differently depending, again, on the context of how this has come into their lives. I wonder what do you think? Yeah, you were in such a different place where I went. In my mind, right, and I agree with everything you said, I completely agree with you, but in my mind the child would feel a sense of calm, a sense of power and a sense of control mm. about what's going on. And they would feel, it would alleviate their distress for that feeling because they'd feel... OK, I'm being listened to. I'm being recognized as a serious person. I'm being given due attention. Mm. I'm everybody is recalibrating who I am. Everybody's re re kind of assessing me, reevaluating me. And I'm in control of this. And that, I think, would be yeah, without a doubt, there would be an uptick in their mood and their feeling and the, how they're feeling. Is it necessarily good for them? I don't know, because it reminds me mm. in a little way um, of, I know that when people first tip in, so, so many people who then develop quite serious eating disorders, at the start, it was fabulous. I was losing weight. People were telling me I look gorgeous. I was uh, I was in control. I knew what I was doing. I was I was just knocking it out of the park. I was mm -hmm. getting up in the morning. I was doing my exercise. I was doing the food. I was getting it right. Everybody was telling me I was brilliant. And frankly, I was. And I feel a bit invincible because I am powerful. I'm able to pull this off. Nobody else seems to. Look at these lightweights. That's the way mm. the eating disorder person is talking to themselves. They've suddenly, they, they re kind of, they reassess everything and they feel very powerful. And they're in that strong place where, by the way, it's quite hard to impact as a therapist at that point, because they're in euphoria, oh, yeah. they are yeah. invincible and everybody else is frankly a bit of a slob and a half as strong yes, or as yes. impressive or as disciplined or as yes. powerful as they are. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I would say it's very similar if you bring that over to the socially transitioned child. It's powerful. It's strong. I'm in control. Everybody understands that I am somebody to be reckoned with and I need to mm -hmm. be listened to. And I'm going to tell them all how to speak about me and how to think about me. And if mm. I spot somebody, and I will spot people, I will take them up on it. And you know what? I'll have the weight of everybody on my side if I take anybody up on it. Mm. It seems incredibly similar to me. I, I think, again, I, there's so many iterations of how this comes up. I think you're totally right. But there's another version of this that I've seen, which is... The kid starts. The kid starts analyzing their difficulties through the lens of gender, and they start piecing things together. Usually through help of the internet or support groups, or kind of they're really binging on the the gender oh, yeah. identity stuff. Oh, yeah. 
And then they conclude, okay, I have to come out as trans and I have to start identifying as That's a boy. Right. And if they have the social transition support from the school, they're all of a sudden in a brand new predicament, which is I have to successfully convince everyone that I am a guy. Oh, yeah. So sometimes I don't see it being that empowering, euphoric oh, yeah. feeling at all. Sometimes the kid really tanks because they are now hyper self-conscious about every inch of their body, yeah. every hair, which direction gaze, is it standing, my shirt, shoulders. I'm pulling on it yeah. constantly, I'm hunched over, I'm swimming in oversized sweaters, I'm walking along the wall, I don't want to be seen, I don't want to be caught, I don't want to be found because out. Because everybody is judging me if I'm yes. good enough to be trans, am I trans enough? Or I don't want to be trans, I just want to be a guy. I don't want to be trans. Yeah. So, you know, there are some kids who are like, I'm really proud of being transgender. Yeah. Like, this is who I am. And yeah, I'm part of this non-binary blah, blah, blah. But there are some kids yeah. that are just like trying to disappear. And uh, it does the social transition doesn't always actually give kids that power. Sometimes they've yeah. gotten into a situation that is so overwhelming, they're, they're kind of <coughs> get stuck. And not only that, but their bodies are changing. At the very same time as all of that, their bodies, puberty is well in, their bodies are changing, they're feeling panicked because they've often been told by the internet often that like these changes are irreversible and you really need to mm. stop them and, and, and they're not being stopped. And look, I'm, I'm out of control. And that feeling of being out of control anyway, and then as well as that, I find a lot of kids as well are agonizing. Am I trans? Am I really trans? I think I'm trans. But yesterday I didn't think I was trans. Maybe I'm not trans. And they're mm. in this constant. Da, 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 da. And to me, is it it's kind of some sort of am I good enough? Am I am I OK or something? Yeah. It's what they're thinking to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I think it's important that you brought up this idea that the body is changing and I'm not going to be able to handle the changes of the body because to kind of circle back to how we opened, you know, I was listening to and reading a lot of stories from families who did decide to early transition their kids. And really when, when push comes to shove and you ask the doctors and the clinicians who are like, you know, uh, puberty blockers, they're experimental and we don't know what's going to happen. And well, then why are we doing this? It's always suicide, you know, and we, we talked about this in another episode, of course. But parents, I think even the ones who do things in, in terms of the way they respond to their children's gender questioning that I don't agree with, I think they mean well, but they're really terrified that something because their child is questioning their gender, that means they're this vulnerable, fragile person who is at a high risk of suicide. And that is also used to justify stuff like social transition. And this, you are so right. I'm so glad you brought it up because I've had so many parents because, like I say, I was this nonconform and I think they, they're attracted to me. So they, mm. they write to me often and they might say, you know, my child is six and I, you know, I, I, I had to transition them yes, last year because I was so frightened of the suicide threat. And it's like, but there's, there's no suicide threat when they're five. Th th this is not, this isn't a, a valid kind of reason to really absolutely change your entire, your child's entire perception of themselves and also change all the, all the, the school and the families. So people think social transition is uh, a, they, they, they see it casual and flippant, you know, and it's, it's kind of quite contradictory because it's, it's kind of done quite easily sometimes. And at the same time, they think it's saving people from suicide. And these, both of these things are myths. Mm -hmm. Neither is mm -hmm. true. There's no suggestion. Like I say, you might feel better after social transition initially. But with all these studies, I, I don't think it's really important how they feel in the first six months or 12 months. What's important is the long term impact because if you are in distress sometimes the short-term impact is important but it's easy to do pleasant short-term impacts there's lots of short-term impacts that you can do to cheer somebody up the yeah. long-term ones are much more important mm -hmm. and that the social transition is a long-term but the suicide 
I don't know an awful lot of schools presume that they can carry out this powerful therapeutic intervention, such as social transition, because if they don't, there's a, a threat of suicide. As if they've collectively forgotten that they've been teachers for 40 years or 30 years, and this wasn't an issue mm-hmm, until mm-hmm, the last mm-hmm, three or four or five mm-hmm. years. It's astonishing. It's totally astonishing. And what's completely missing in the whole conversation is the nuance and the granularity of various ways an adult or a teacher or a parent might respond. So interestingly, like as much as we're trying to smash binaries, there's such a clear manipulative binary that's painted around this issue. So like as I was reading all these stories of early intervention and affirmation, they were always contrasted against very, very uh, homophobic and transphobic families responding in a negative way to yeah. a child. So like they would say either you affirm the child and tell them that they are the sex they claim to be and you dress them that way, you call them that way, you change the pronouns, you change everything at school, or you can be like this terrible parent who kicked the kid out of the house and called them a, a fag sissy or like some horrible like derogatory thing and i'm like where's all of the actual families like i've talked to so many families that are like we love you we support you we're gonna take our time here we want to explore where this is coming from like there's never a mention of a normal response it's always some psychotic like complete (laughs) complete affirmation or like the most horrific villain exactly i mean I just cannot, I the cannot same stand it. Yeah. It's so dishonest. It just drives me crazy. And it's not accurate. It's not accurate at all because the vast majority of parents are very loving, very engaged and want what's best for their children. You know, that that is most parents out there, yeah. you know. We yeah. forget that. And there's been a terrible, awful kind of injustice has been done to parents in the last 30 years. It's the kind of parenting industry And I'm part of it and I always feel guilty about it. And I I do write a lot in defense of the parents as a result for my sins. But I really do because I I really know I really feel it's very true. And I know it as I'm a parent myself, you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't. But it's not only that, but the parents and the school collude with this is the most positive it's 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 just it's easy it's kind it's all these weird words that have nothing to do with the power of an intervention that you're changing the reality of everybody everybody's perception of this child Mm -hmm. you're solidifying Mm -hmm. an identity you're also very often changing policy within schools we don't know what the impact is i don't know what where i stand personally i think there should be a third space myself for kind of um, toilets and changing rooms so that you can have the boys, you can have the girls and you can have Mm -hmm. the third space. It seems Mm -hmm. to be the easiest kind of solution for non-conforming children who are in massive distress to to use, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. Have you have you got strong thoughts on that? I'm asked it all the time these days. I mean, I think having like a, a neutral third space is appropriate. I just think it's tricky because so much of this is like temporally dependent, like at this particular period in time in our culture here in certain countries, like this is even a thing. And I don't mean to say that like, there's no such thing as people who otherwise would have struggled with gender dysphoria and really, you know, ultimately become a transgender person. But it's just so contextually dependent. There is. Yeah, you're right. There is. But also, I suppose as a parent, I did notice and so did my husband notice when he was, you know, changing the nappies of the kids or when the kid is four and he wanted to go into the toilet with the four year old girl. There is mm. no place for the father to go mm. into the toilet yeah. with the four. There's so like there, family, family restrooms and stuff like that. There is, but not mm-hmm. often. Very yeah, often yeah, there isn't. Right. And that's so it's right. a complicated, weird little thing that we haven't quite figured out anyway. But I, I do think that um, we've got to start a, kind of grasping this and start thinking, what is the best way forward so that people can be fluid around toilets around names and around pronouns and not feel that they're in a box and also that people realize that you can't change other people's opinion or views or thoughts you're not allowed it's not within my power to change how you think of me Sasha Mm. (laughs) much as I try (laughs) I, I I don't have that I don't have that power I never will have that power and I think these kids who are socially transitioning honestly think 
I'm changing everybody's view of me. It's so it's so um, unfair because the adults in the room are really kind of using the power of suggestion, I think, to push kids to believe that. Like, first of all, you know, young people, because they tend to be more inclined towards things like fantasy and, you know, adolescents have this developmental sense of persecution, like nobody understands me, no one knows who I really am. Like, that's a part of growing up. We all went there, you know. So it's it's so unfair that adults take those temporary developmental moments and build entire like school administrative infrastructure around it. It's kind of cra- crazy when you think about it. But mm. I, I'm thinking about like this one video that I saw where the reporter was like asking a 16 year old, you know, what would you what would you do if you didn't have access to social transition? Like, how would you survive? And of course, the kid is like, I, I think it would be so awful. I couldn't tolerate it. And it's just like the power of suggestibility is yeah. so intense. And if we, I, I say this a lot, like if we do not guard that with a lot of care and thought, we are really mistreating these children I mean, how can how can it be okay to treat something like using the right pronouns as a life or death situation for a kid? That's so unfair. Why would you say that to a child who's already dysregulated, distressed, going through adolescence, struggling with their friends, struggling with their body? Why would you tell them that the wrong pronouns could kill you? In, I mean, this one video that I saw, somebody literally said, this is a life or death issue oh. for these children. How is that a good idea? I mean, in Ever. what world is that a good S- idea? Somebody, like not somebody, the, the entire society has just decided that this is life or death. We We have made this situation so, so misinterpreted like stats that were frankly from online surveys and things like that. We've made these massive changes in these kids. And I think, you know, like through through experience, we're going to realize it was high handed of us and it was inappropriate to kind of allow children to do anything they, they, they wish with their name and their identity and to try and shape other people's views of themselves. But right now we're in the middle of that process and we've got to stop suicide and and kind of inappropriate con- context of suicide mm-hmm. to be shaping decisions that it's just not true. Mm-hmm. I, I want to say one more thing because we, we've talked a lot in this episode so far about, you know, children leading the way or letting the young distressed person make all the, sh- the calls and, you know, call all the shots. But I'm also aware that this has a an even more kind of confusing dark side, which is that if a child is questioning their gender or they are, you know, considering social transition to some degree and they start sharing that information with trusted adults or school staff or a counselor, it is really important that the school not take an accelerated approach to setting out the pace of change for that child. I have met young people who maybe are comfortable identifying as trans or perhaps they find that that label suits them, but they were pressured and rushed by staff to accelerate the process of integration with, let's say, you know, joining the other boys in the boys locker room if you're a, you know, female to male trans kid and like pushed into the role as though We could just erase the fact that this is a kid in transition. It's not a kid who's magically got the light switch turned on to boy mode and now they can seamlessly integrate with the other boys. If this is a trans boy, where is the respect for the process? And so this whole idea of social transition, especially when it's become this kind of like bureaucratic thing, like school has to follow these particular rules it just destroys the entire element of like 
time and process and figuring things out and let's kind of take it slowly and let's see how this feels or let's experiment with this. So even in a case where a family and the school and the child is on board with a social transition, that still has to be treated with an immense amount of care and caution. And just that gets completely missed when you throw in the terror of suicide, because of course that accelerates everything to like this crisis mode, you know? And also humility, you know, I think well-meaning misinformed adults could do with more humility about the enthusiasm of thinking that you're, you're saving a child. You know, it can go to your head. I, you know, I, I, I'm as mm. human as the rest of them in that. And you can really feel that you are that important adult that's saving this child's life. And actually, sometimes you need to take a step back. And the presumption that the, the parents uh, aren't that great and that you have more wisdom when honestly, the parents probably know that child a good deal more than you do and probably have yeah. insights that you've never even thought about about this yeah. child so it's really important that schools learn some humility and realize that they could they've never before en masse socially transitioned children they're doing it now without any reflection without any kind of guidance that is is kind of got any sort of evidence base they're doing it with guidance that is frankly me and you could write it everybody it's all this guidance that hasn't got an evidence base and so it's kind of it's frightening how how easily it's being done, how kind of blithely it's being done, as opposed to uh, with respect and kind of deference to you don't mess around with children's identities because they're, they're fragile in their own way, you know. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RHYME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long term care for gender variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 